Hey there, thank you for tuning into Duck Bricks and welcome to a brand new episode of Bionicle Retold, the show where I recap and summarize the entire Lego Bionicle storyline from beginning to the end. Last time we kicked things off with Chapter 1, Beginnings, investigating the birth of a brand new universe. And as usual, I'll be giving the spoiler warning for the show. If you actually do want to consume the Bionicle storyline the way that it was intended to be told, please go check out the How to Get Started with the Bionicle Storyline video linked in the description below, which is specifically tailored to people who do not want to be spoiled and instead actually want to get into the story themselves by playing the first game and reading the books. However, if you're here to get a lore breakdown where I summarize everything in chronological order, then you're in the right place, because I will be spoiling all of the major twists, probably before they even happen in the story, just to make sure you can very clearly understand everything that's going on. But with that out of the way, I'll just dive right into the recap, where we'll summarize what happened last time in Bionicle Retold. Previously on Bionicle Retold, Birth of a New Universe. After a catastrophic extinction level event that split the world of Spherus Magna in three, a colossal robot rockets away from the destruction, carrying a hybrid species so technologically advanced that they are indistinguishable from fully sentient species. The body of this Matanui robot houses several spheres, with climate-controlled islands and unique ecosystems within. Housed inside this robot are dozens of unique species. Matoran laborers maintaining the robot, animalistic Rahi guarding the boundaries, noble Toa warriors protecting the Matoran, and wise Turaga elders guiding society. The sparks of sentience fan a flame of diverse development, with the Order of Mata Nui keeping a watchful eye over the universe while working with the Brotherhood of Makuta to keep the peace. Until now, the only threat has been the mindless Zyglak, byproducts of ancient science united in their will to destroy. But darkness is growing at the heart of this universe, and the fragile peace is not to last. This is Bionicle Retold. Chapter 2 Rise of the Brotherhood Part 1 Reign of the Six Kingdoms With the Toa Mata failsafe deep in slumber and the completion of the great city of Metru Nui housed in the brain of the robot, construction on the internal workings of the robot had finally come to an end. The Matoran laborers spread out amongst the island domes were separated, isolated to their own homelands and regions. And so, to maintain order and unite all disparate aspects of the Matoran universe, the great spirit Mata Nui saw fit to bring six new, prime species into existence. Perfect physical specimens who radiated beauty and absolute power, these rulers were known as the Baraki, which in the Matoran language translates directly to warlords. The Baraki consisted of Prydak, the strongest and fastest of them all, Kalma, a cruel and emotionless ruler, the secretive and isolated Mantax, Elek, who was once the most brutal of them all, Karapar, an incredibly powerful physical force, and Takadox, a cunning and treacherous warlord with an eerie hypnosis ability that held his armies in his thrall. Just a side note, the images shown on screen like this guy right here for the Baraki are actually for mutated versions of the Baraki. Of course, these are not the prime specimens that they once were, but as to why they were mutated, well, you're going to have to wait and find out for that. But unfortunately, we do not have any images of the Baraki pre-mutation, so any images shown on screen here are for the post-mutation Baraki. They're the same characters, just underwent a bit of a physical transformation, which we'll delve into much, much later in the coming chapters. The rule of the Baraki lasted for nearly a thousand years, resulting in a massive military campaign to form an empire spanning most of the known universe. After each of the six Baraki maintained peace over their own sector of the Matoran universe, they banded together in an alliance known as the League of Six Kingdoms. Led overall by Pradact, this league lasted for more than 14 millennia before it was dissolved. 
but absolute power corrupts absolutely, and as the Baraki exercise their power as some of the most prominent political and military figures in the universe, it became apparent that some of the methods they used to accomplish their goals were far from peaceful, and arose instead from a desire for the acquisition of wealth, tyrannical domination, and yet more sinister, the overthrow of the Great Spirit himself. Monitoring the political situation intensely, the Brotherhood of Makuta, sworn guardians and defenders of the Great Spirit Mata Nui, paid off the treacherous Takadox to act as their spy on the inside of the League of the Six Kingdoms, reporting back to them with troop movements and plans. With the League's main focus now twisted from the preservation of order to the complete domination of all life, the Matoran universe was under a complete, totalitarian state of rule. Matoran were forced to abandon their posts and take up arms as the League drafted more and more people into their armies. And despite Metro Nui signing a trade agreement in exchange for sovereignty and freedom, all other domes across the universe soon fell to control of the Six Kingdoms, with the Baraki succeeding in their initial goal to unite the universe, but at a great cost. It was at this point that the Brotherhood of Makuta decided to step in. Takadox, the mole inside the League, informed the Brotherhood that the Baraki were prepping their armies to overthrow the great spirit Mata Nui himself. Seeing these warlords had gone too far, the Brotherhood of Makuta, led by the powerful Makuta Miserix, summoned their own armies to pour forth from their colossal fortresses. Partnered with every available Toa team, they were led in battle by Makuta Teradax, a high-ranking lieutenant of the Brotherhood. This combined army swept across the forces of the League, overwhelming them in a climactic surprise attack. And so, with their armies defeated and driven away, the six warlords were brought before Makuta Teradax, bound and begging for their lives. In a final act of desperation, the Baraki revealed their details of their plans to Makuta Teradax, begging him to join them to rule over all the universe. In the moment, Teradax rejected their treasonous offers, sentencing them all to execution for their crimes against Mata Nui. Although, of course, he secretly planned to spare Takadox for all his help and information. But before Teradax got a chance to execute this punishment and reveal to the Baraki who had betrayed them, a crack of energy blasted through the empty battlefield, materializing a being out of thin air before the disgraced Baraki and Teradax himself. While unaware at the moment, we now know this to be the being known as Botar, teleporting servant of the mysterious Order of Mata Nui. Unbeknownst to Teradax and the rest of the Makuta, the Order of Mata Nui had a far worse fate planned for the Baraki. To punish them for their failed revolt, these secret servants of Mata Nui tasked Botar to teleport the Baraki to a massive prison known as the Pit, where they would spend the rest of their eternal lives imprisoned in the darkest depths of the universe. And so as energy bonds wrapped around the Baraki and they began to vanish before Teradax's eyes, this marked the end of the League of Six Kingdoms. But although the Baraki faded from history and were now forgotten, their ideas remained in the mind of Teradax, the first seeds of what was to one day become the darkest and most destructive plot in the history of the Matoran universe. Part 2. Rise of the Dark Hunters A time of subdued chaos followed these momentous events. With the fall of the League of Six Kingdoms, one of the most powerful and influential forces in the universe, a vacuum of leadership was created. In this vacuum of order and power, trouble began to brew on distant islands throughout the universe. On a secluded island in the southern realms of the robot, a being who would later be codenamed Ancient revolted against the government of his home island, doing dirty work for the highest bidder. Ancient's actions quickly plunged this island into chaos, starting a bloody civil war that resulted in most of the island's population to be wiped out. And as the dust settled, Ancient was approached by another being later known as the Shadowed One with a business proposition work together and form a shadowy organization in the underbelly of the universe, doing dirty work for good pay. Thus, the idea of the Dark Hunters, one of the most infamous organizations in history, was born. Conquering a small island called Odina and establishing a massive fortress on its shore, Ancient and the Shadowed One began to rapidly recruit displaced warriors from the disbanded armies of the League. This group would quickly grow in number, consisting of corrupted beings, rogue Toa, bestial tyrants, sadistic murderers, convicted criminals, insane wanderers, and anyone else corrupt and crazy enough to join their ranks. Bit of a fun fact here, the vast majority of the Dark Hunters, like Ancient here, were actually fan models that were canonized in a major contest that the LEGO Group ran in 2005 to put every single Dark Hunter in a guidebook made up of mocks of different characters and builders in the community. 
You can actually check out all of these models because I'm doing a weekly review series called Bionicle Fan and Reviews, where I'm reviewing every fan-created canonized Bionicle model, just like this one. So if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, please feel free to go check it out. Part 3. The Great Disruption As the Dark Hunters grew in power, the rest of the universe stumbled. Strife, malcontent, and disorder spread across the lands, reaching into the very heart of the Toran civilization. Metru Nui itself. Thus, 500 years after the defeat of the Baraki, the period known as the Great Disruption began. Heralded by the Matoran Civil War, the Great Disruption marked a dark time for the universe. With no more Baraki present to keep the Matoran in check, it wasn't long until things began to spiral out of control. It all started with a minor dispute between Pomatoran, the builders and workers of stone, and Tomatoran, the crafters and smelters of fire. A small skirmish over trade boundaries and legislation resulted in more and more malicious acts, with angered Pomatorans sinking Tomatorn barges, and the Tomatorn reacting by allying themselves with the normally peaceful Gamatorn, who attempted to stop the conflict. These attempts were unsuccessful, and soon, all work in Metro Nui ceased as the city was engulfed in a full-on civil war. Onu Matorn of Earth joined with Ga and Tomatorn, as the Le Matorn of Air and Ko Matorn of Ice banded together with the Pomatorn. With the city descending into violence, the main hub keeping the Great Spirit Robot active and functioning was essentially offline, causing a ripple effect through the rest of the universe. The best way to imagine just the sheer amount of damage done to the rest of the robot, and in turn the Matoran universe, by Metro Nui going offline, is probably by imagining what happens to your own body when you get severe head trauma, or say your brain just decides to shut down. Definitely not a good thing for all of the rest of the systems of the body, especially if the head itself is completely powered off. Which was essentially what was happening while the Matoran were busy fighting each other instead of performing their tasks. For 400 years, the Matoran civil war raged across Metru Nui, plummeting the rest of the universe into darkness. Once again, the task fell to the Brotherhood of Makuta, the de facto defenders of order in the universe, to remedy the situation. With Makuta Teradax leading the military forces yet again, a drastic plan was enacted. Remember how one of the main goals of the robot was to catalog and accumulate vast archives of information about animals, creatures, and civilizations? While well, a vast majority of these animals were contained by force in the great archives of Onumetru, where underground tunnels and passageways held copies of every species that had been discovered thus far, including some of the most vicious Rahi. And so, in a severe act to stop the civil war, Makuta Teradax and his forces rounded up many of the most militaristic Matoran, sealing them in the archives and unleashing the vicious animals within to purge the survivors. The Matoran leaders who spurred on the conflict were yet again teleported to the pit by Botar, just like the Baraki before them. While this traumatic event known as the Archives Massacre did its job to terrify the Matoran into subjugation and stop the civil war, the damage was done. Additionally, the bloody methods employed by the Makuta, lacking any thought for the preservation of life, sparked enduring distrust between the Matoran and the Brotherhood. The consequences of the Great Disruption were far more widespread than anyone realized. The Great Spirit had been so greatly weakened by the events of the Civil War that he now neared death. Recap Time! In Chapter 1 Beginnings, we explained that there were three legendary Kanohi masks, the most important of which was the Kanohi Ignika, whose important role was to kickstart the Matoran universe and the Great Spirit's life should its life force ever dwindle. The way it works is that any member of the Matoran universe can wear the Ignika on their face, thus absorbing their life energy and sacrificing themselves to kickstart the universe, thus saving the entire world and Matanui's life. So it was that a Toa of Magnetism called Jovan was charged with leading a group of his fellow Toa to the heart of the southern continent, to the raging volcano of Mount Valmai. Beneath the fiery mountain, Jovan and his team discovered a mage of passageways filled with a host of trials, and were tested time and time again by the guardians of the mountain's secret. They proved themselves worthy, and at last came to the Chamber of Life, in which waited the Kanohi Ignika, the Mask of Life. Placed there by the great being long ages ago, the Ignika had waited for one destined to take it and use it, and its bearer had come. The group of Toa took the Ignika from its chamber, and traveled even farther down beneath the surface of the continent, eventually arriving in Kata Nui, the core of the universe. 
The Toa who was destined to wear the Anika did so, fearfully and with regret in his heart, and was consumed by the energies of the mask. His life energy was channeled through the mask and used to replenish the life of the dying Great Spirit. The death of their fellow Toa and the fearful power of the Ignika shocked and terrified the remaining members of the group, who hurriedly returned the mask to its chamber and left in fear and awe. Only Jovan, leader of the group, chose to stay. Giving up his power for the greater good and becoming a Turaga, he settled amongst the Matoran who lived near Mount Valmai, his destiny fulfilled and the utter destruction of the universe averted. Part 4. Evolution of the Makuta And so, with one major catastrophe put behind them, the Matoran universe settled into a period of rebirth and rebuilding. Metru Nui was slowly rebuilt, and while distrust and prejudice between certain sects of the Matoran still remained, for the most part, all evidence of the civil war was swept aside to the history books. In the meantime, the Brotherhood of Makuta focused on damage control and anticipating any upcoming threats, as they had allowed the two previous major threats to exist for far too long. A member in their ranks named Mutron was tasked with ensuring the entity Tren Krom from the early days of the universe did not remain a threat. Here's a bit of recap from the prologue, The Core War. Tren Krom was a being created by the great beings to govern the Matoran universe while it was still being constructed far before the time of Artaka, Karzani, or even the great spirit Madanui himself. Trenkrom was a horrendous reptilian organism who featured incredible telepathic abilities, using his powers to bridge his mind between himself and any member of the Matoran universe to uncover their secrets and to be able to control their will. Upon discovering Trenkrom's island, Makuta Mutron was immediately seized, while Trenkrom bridged their minds, catching up on all the events of the universe that he had missed. In return, however, he inadvertently shared some of his memories with Mutron, namely that everyone was created by the great beings, and the great spirit Mata Nui was, in fact, a colossal AI controlling a robot hurtling through space, and it was possible to overthrow the Mata Nui AI consciousness. However, Mutron was expressly loyal to Makuta Teradax, not the true ruler of the Brotherhood, who was Makuta Miserix. Since Teradax had led them into battle as Miserix's lieutenant time and time again, Mutron's true loyalties lay with him, and immediately after returning to the Makuta Fortress on Destral, Mutron conveyed what he had learned from Tren Krom directly to Teradax, who immediately called a major convocation, something no Makuta other than Miserix was allowed to do. With all the members of the Brotherhood of Makuta gathered in one chamber, Teradax gave a grand speech, urging them that with this knowledge, the Makuta had the power to take over the entire universe, arguing that since they did all the dirty work for Mata Nui anyways, why not have them be the ones in control? Miserix, leader of the Brotherhood, stood firm in his values, arguing that Teradax's crazy plan could end up destroying the entire universe, and this was all a bid by Teradax to overthrow him. And so after a brutal fight between the two, the Makuta were called to a vote, Teradax as their leader, or Miserix. While Miserix still had some staunch supporters, more and more Makuta were swayed to Teradax's side, with the remaining defenders of Miserix being forced to side with Teradax to go with the majority. Two members of their ranks, Makuta Spiria and Makuta Krika, were then ordered to kill Miserix, but since they had been secret supporters of Miserix, neither had the heart to kill him, instead sneaking him off the island and faking his death to Teradax. With Miserix out of the picture and marooned on an isolated island with no allies, Teradax began a massive restructuring of the Brotherhood, tasking his most loyal lieutenants, Gorast and Ikarax, to kill any Makuta who had originally sided with Miserix. Teradax then tasked scientists within the Brotherhood to seek out new races within the Matoran universe to see if any could be modified for war, prepping for the eventual takeover of the universe. Makuta Spiria discovered a peaceful yet physically adept race known as the Skakti, who he saw fit to alter with viruses, granting them powerful laser vision and even elemental abilities when two Skakti work in conjunction with each other. After this newfound evolution of the Skakti, Spiria left them to their own devices, leaving some Rahi of his own design called Vizorak on the island to keep them in line. But when Spiria returned, it was a total war zone. The Skakti had shed their peaceful ways and with their newfound abilities, defeated the Vizorak guards and started to slaughter each other in bids for power. Not only did he amplify their abilities too much, but he instilled in them a sense of violence and conquest to make them uncontrollable by the Makuta. As a result, Spiria was banished from the Brotherhood for killing a race, replacing them with horrible monsters who did nothing but destroy.
of course, we'll see this band of vicious murderers and psychopathic criminals at some point in the future. Just you wait for the later chapters. While the Brotherhood continued these experiments and began to cease contact with other organizations in the universe, the Order of Mata Nui grew concerned, suspicious of the secrecy surrounding their latest ideals. Since the Brotherhood of Makuta used the element of shadow as a primary power source, they would be particularly vulnerable to the element of light, particularly if any Av Matoran were to transform into Toa of Light. Prematurely acting out of suspicion, the Order of Mata Nui removed several of these Matoran of Light from their homeland as a failsafe, hiding them from the Brotherhood and disguising them as Matoran of other elements to conceal their true nature and brainwashing them into thinking they were ordinary Matoran of other elements. They were then scattered to random parts of the Matoran universe, decentralizing the main hub of Av Matoran. And so, after this task was completed, Mata Nui erased the memories of the previous six months from everyone in the Matoran universe, save members of the Order. This led to a gap in recorded history known as the Time Slip, where most Av Matoran vanished, unbeknownst to the population en masse. And as the years passed, the Makuta species began to slowly evolve, shedding the need for robotic parts and transmuting into a gaseous substance now known as Antidermis. This evolution did come with a significant weakness. Should the robotic armor of the Makuta be breached, the Antidermis containing the essence of the Makuta would seep out, eventually killing the Makuta within. However, this evolution gave the Makuta new abilities, such as the power to possess any purely robotic shell or suit of armor. Part 5. Tale of Toa Likan During all these events, the grand city of Metro Nui operated in a period of relative peace, under the firm but just rule of Taraga Duma, an experienced elder who had served as a Toa for more than 2,000 years. Under the leadership of Taraga Duma, Metro Nui became a center for innovation and invention. The archives of Onu Metru, a massive museum and catalog of all known species and objects in the universe, were expanded and improved. New technologies such as the Kanoka Discs, base materials to make new Kanoki masks, were invented, along with improved methods for forging Kanoki. Security and peace were maintained with the invention of robotic order enforcement squads called Vaki. Duma was also directly responsible for the mentorship and journey of one Matoran named Likon in his transformation into a Toa hero, protector of Metra Nui. Soon after his creation, Likon too grew wary of the Brotherhood of Makuta, carving a stone tablet in secret alongside some other Toa he trusted. They then hid this Makoki stone, detailing the powers of a Makuta, their locations, and other essential information within a heavily guarded fortress, unknowingly close to a camp of vicious Rahi called Frostelis. When word of this stone reached the Dark Hunters, the Shadowed One sent some hunters to raid the fortress and seize this incredibly detailed and valuable tablet of information for themselves. Amidst all this chaos, the neighboring Frostelis chose to strike the fortress and claim it as their territory, resulting in the Makoki Stone being lost to the Dark Hunters, and all of Likon's teammates and friends being killed. As Likon fled the fortress, he swore to never run away from anything ever again. Eventually, the Dark Hunters split the Makoki Stone into six parts and auctioned off each part, with all six components eventually being bought out by the Brotherhood of Makuta themselves, who sought to be the ones to hold all their secrets close at hand. But as it turns out, Likon would soon have another chance to prove himself in the defense of Metru Nui. As the ambitious Shadowed One, leader of the Dark Hunters, bent his thoughts on the conquest of Metru Nui, he unleashed a monstrous Rahi called the Kanohi Dragon from an icy prison deep beneath the waves of the Silver Sea, where it had been trapped countless millennia ago. Awakening from its ageless slumber, the enraged dragon emerged from the depths in a blast of heat and flame, burrowing up from the bottom of the archives and wreaking havoc amongst the tall towers and buildings. Eventually, the beast made its way to the great furnace of Tometru, where it settled to rest and absorb the immense heat. Taraga Duma immediately sent out messages calling for help and summoned Likon and all available Toa to confront the terrible monster. The Toa arrived just in time to save Turaga Duma from three Dark Hunters who were attempting to blackmail Duma into securing a base for them within the city. The Hunters escaped, leaving the Toa to confront the Kanohi Dragon alone. And after a long and tiring battle, they succeeded. Four Toa of Ice froze the Kanohi Dragon in an immense block of ice, putting a final end to its destruction. The subdued dragon was taken to the island of Zia, where it was given to the Vortex species for imprisonment. 
Eleven Toa, now led by Likan, then decided to remain in the city to defend against the growing threats of the Dark Hunters. This new team of Toa, dubbed the Toa Mangai, served as the prominent protectors of Metro Nui, warding off most of the Shadow One's attempts to breach the city walls. During this time, a rash of inexplicable Matoran murders occurred in Metro Nui. At this time, only three Toa were left to protect the city. Likon, Toa of Fire, Nidiki, Toa of Air, and Tuyet, Toa of Water. As a state of emergency was declared in Metro Nui, the three Toa set out to hunt this serial killer on the loose. Discovered with the bodies of the murdered Matoran were tablets inscribed with the name of one Toa, Toa Tuyet. After confronting their comrade, Likon and Nidiki got Tuyet to confess that the Dark Hunters were blackmailing her, believing her to be in possession of an incredibly powerful artifact known as the Nui Stone, created by unknown beings in the universe to absorb the powers of any Toa in their area and bestow their powers to the user. Each day that Tuyet refused to give the stone to the Dark Hunters, they would murder a new Matoran. Claiming to not actually have the stone, Tuyet joined Likon and Nidiki in flushing out the Dark Hunters, with Likon and Nidiki successfully capturing a few Dark Hunters as they discovered lurking around the area. But to their dismay, the murders continued, even with the Dark Hunters imprisoned. Immediately realizing Tuyet must be behind the murders, Likon immediately went to confront her. Tuyet then revealed that she did in fact possess the Nui Stone, and used its powers of Toa absorption to enhance her elemental abilities. She attacked Likon, intending to use her powers to set herself up as the sole ruler of Metro Nui. But this attack was in vain, as Nadiki and Likon together were able to defeat her, blasting the stone with fire, destroying it. As was the case with all prior insurrectionists, the teleporting being known as Botar appeared to teleport Tuyet away to serve her sentence, but this was not the last time we would see of her. Tune in to sometime around chapters 7 or 8, where Tuyet and the Nui Stone became very, very relevant to what we'd call the main story. Until then, just file this information away in your mind, because it's not going to be relevant for the next several chapters. I'm just giving you this information now because it takes place at this particular point in time to fit with the timeline. The events of Tuyet's shocking betrayal and the chaos now gripping Metro Nui prompted the Shadowed One to strike, bringing on a great Toa Dark Hunter war as the Shadowed One sent his forces to seize Metro Nui for his own nefarious purposes. Despite the war being fought valiantly, with many Toa giving their lives for Metro Nui, the Dark Hunters eventually overwhelmed the city, beating down the Toa as a constant barrage. During this volatile time, a Dark Huntress named Lariska convinced Toa Nidiki to betray his brothers and join the Dark Hunters, promising to spare him and even allow him to rule parts of the city once the Dark Hunters inevitably overthrew Taragaduma. Little did Nidiki know, but Likon had been secretly listening in on this deal, and after Nidiki made major moves to betray his fellow Toa, Likon struck back, surprising the Dark Hunters and Nidiki, winning a conclusive victory over their forces. Honorably, Likan let the enemies go, with the promise that they never return to Metro Nui, and they take the treacherous Nidiki with them. Following these events, the Shadowed One inducted a reluctant Nidiki into his ranks, partnering him with the brutish and unintelligent Dark Hunter Kreka to keep him in line, knowing his penchant for betrayal. And as the time passed, Nidiki grew weary of his membership in the Dark Hunter ranks, seeking any way out he could find. And as it turns out, Opportunity struck with the arrival of a mysterious stranger named Rudaka on the island, who sought to be trained by the Dark Hunters and increase her fighting prowess. Nidiki immediately approached her, promising to train her in return for a ticket off the island. But Rudaka was a dishonest and traitorous being, much like Nidiki himself, and at the first opportunity, she backstabbed Nidiki, selling him out to the Shadowed One and revealing his intent to leave their ranks. And so as a cruel punishment, the Shadowed One demanded more, telling her that Nidiki had to be stripped of his dreams as a Toa once and for all. Rudaka then used her customized weapon called Rotuka on Nidiki, mutating him into a hideous four-legged creature, bereft of his elemental powers and with no choice left but to submit to the Dark Hunter's will. Part 6. Corruption of the Makuta For many millennia, the Toa Haga, an elite Toa team, were tasked as Pterodax's personal bodyguards. With their job to protect this leader of the Brotherhood of Makuta from harm, the Toa Haga truly believed they were performing an honorable deed. But as time progressed, the Toa Haga discovered a horrible truth. 
that Makuda had been directly responsible for a series of mysterious and dark attacks and misdeeds in recent history. In a massive strike force against the holy city of Artaka, the Makuda who was originally tasked to protect Artaka turned against it, stealing the powerful Kanohi Evoki, the Mask of Light, from Artaka's fortresses with an army of robotic Exotoa armor, Visorak spiders, and Rakshi, particularly devious Rahi loyal to Makuda. The Makuda also had been partnering with the Dark Hunters, funding their recent strikes and fueling the conflict between them and Metronui and even held sway over the vicious Visorak hordes, long thought to be an uncontrolled menace or Rahi experiment gone wrong. At once, the Toahaga launched a raid on the Brotherhood Fortress at Destro, where they stole back the Evoki and Makoki stones, but not before four of their members were captured by the ruthless Rudaka, who was now working directly for Teradax after receiving the favor of the Shadowed One for backstabbing and mutating the Diki. Rudaka used those same mutagenic powers to transform the four captured Toahaga into bestial, malformed creatures she called Rahaga, a combination of Haga and Rakshi, for their grotesque appearance resembled the vile Rakshi. Two members of the Haga, Norik, Toa of Fire, and Iruni, Toa of Air, managed to escape after barely beating Makuta Teradax himself in direct combat. And so, after returning to free their mutated comrades, Rudaka struck them in the back as they fled, mutating them too into Rahaga, but not before they were able to escape with the Evoki, Mask of Light, and Makoki Stone. As the former Toahaga, last defense against the Makuta, fled deep into the archives, Teradax was free to enact his plans. Afraid of the Toa's potential to damage their armor, the Makuta began a covert genocide of all Toa of Iron, wiping them off the face of the map. And now, with the treachery of the Brotherhood exposed, Teradax enacted his final plan, infecting the Great Spirit Matanui with a virus, which would gradually render the Great Spirit comatose. Its effects weren't immediately apparent, but would have serious ramifications over the entire universe as a whole. Continuing to enact this grand plan, Teradax imprisoned Turaka Duma and used his shape-shifting powers to impersonate him for over a year and a half. During this time, Teradax, under the guise of the benevolent Turaga Duma, gradually called all Toa away to secure sea gates, where they were killed by a hired Dark Hunter Eliminator. Teradax also hired Nidiki and Kreka, who helped him with various tasks in Metro Nui. And so, with all the Toa Mangai wiped out, only Likon remained. Growing suspicious of Turaga Duma, who had conveniently sent all his comrades to their deaths, Toa Likon readied himself to choose six Matoran to become new Toa in his stead. But that's a story for another time, and the tale of those six Toa who would later become legends of Metru Nui will be told in Chapter 3. Thus concludes Chapter 2, Rise of the Brotherhood, with Teradax poised to overthrow Mata Nui and the entire fate of the Matoran universe hanging in the balance. This was Bionicle Retold. And so the story of Chapter 2, Rise of the Brotherhood, has come to an end. Be sure to tune in in two weeks, where I'll be posting Chapter 3, focusing for the first time on one of the toy line storylines from the Bionicle theme. Previously, Chapters 1 and 2, as well as the prologue, have all been basically set up for the main story. And so we'll dive into the year of 2004 and 2005 next time to cover Legends of Metro Nui, which were the prequel years of the Bionicle universe. Stay tuned for that. Thank you all for tuning in. And as usual, let me know down in the comments below if you were confused by anything, felt like you needed more elaboration on any given topic. Let me know if you have any questions and I will do my best to answer them in the comments and make sure everyone can see those clarifications. Thanks all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Bionicle Retold, and I'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye for now.